<clears throat> All right, um, let's get started. So, um, so last time we discussed the idea of social capital uh, as an inherent property of social groups and not as a property of individuals. We talked about how it could arise because of the structure of social interactions and the nature of those interactions. For example, whether those interactions are trusting or not. And we talked about how social capital was an emergent property of social groups. And, review, and we reviewed some other examples of emergence. And we discussed diverse properties of social capital, like diverse aspects of social capital, including, for example, that it is a public good and some reasons that people might underinvest under invest in social capital and the idea that certain kinds of social traps uh, might arise. Today, I'm going to be emphasizing how social factors may, may affect our biology at a much deeper level than we have been seeing so far in class. Because what we do, what we, because, because the question is, what do we know about how the social becomes biological at, let's say, a genetic or cellular level? It's not just a question of like, okay, uh, you know, if you're poor, you're more likely to get heart disease. The question is, well, what happens inside our bodies at a much more fundamental biological level? And this is a growing and cutting edge field. And I'm only gonna review certain aspects of this today, only in a certain limited uh, a way. I offer a graduate level seminar, Sociology 636 in alternate years, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about this in the future. Now we've seen many examples in the class about how social factors, for example, poverty and education and social support and income inequality can affect our overall health and mortality and also more proximal health measures, for example, like our blood pressure or heart attack risk or immune system function. So we've seen those examples, but could there in fact be something more profound going on? And I'd like to consider three ways that social factors could interact with our genome. The first idea is that there could be, um, the, of how the social could become biological, is that there could be an evolution and sociocultural change, a kind of process whereby over long time horizons, our bodies have been shaped by our social environment. The second set of ideas relates to sort of what is known as gene by environment effects. And here I'm specifically talking about our uh, social environment, and I'll explain this in a little bit more. Um, and uh, a third is this notion of social epigenetics, and I'll explain this too. Epigenetics relates to the regulation of our genes. And here I'm interested in the social regulation of whether our genes are expressed or not. And we'll also consider a little bit of the reverse phenomenon of how the biological becomes social in a field known as behavior genetics insofar as social phenotypes are encoded in our genes. Uh, and the idea here is that I have to show you a little bit about what is the flavor of behavior genetics, which is how our genes shape not just our bodies, but our behaviors, because understanding that is needed to, to understand the topics that are higher up on this list about the reverse path about how the social becomes biological. Anyway, I'll give you a flavor for some of these examples. Um, and you know, obviously if you've had some biology, it's helpful, but it's not essential to understand the basic points we'll be reviewing. Now, ordinarily, humans are seen as evolving under the pressure of the environment they face over vast time scales. And this environment may be seen as being composed of three different types, that is to say, what's going on in our environment that shapes our evolutionary path. There could be physical things about our environment, the sunlight and temperature and water, for instance, that shape the kind of species we are. There could be biological features of our environment. Obviously, our bodies and our behavior have been shaped by the predators and prey and pathogens we have faced before. Early in the course, when we were talking about COVID, for example, we had some examples of how pathogens might shape the kind of you know, kind of genes that we have. And the third type of environment is the social environment. Who or what has surrounded us in the past? And this social environment is often neglected as an evolutionary force. 
Yet social factors are crucial. In fact, it may be social factors that have led us to be an intelligent species in the first place. In the first place. And this is known as the social brain hypothesis, which posits, for example, that one of the reasons we are intelligent is in fact because of the necessity not to make tools, but to make friends. In other words, you're probably familiar with the argument that as a tool making species, you know, we involve this capacity, this cognitive capacity, but there's another set of ideas that says, no, really what it's about is we had to evolve the capacity to get along with each other, that our social environment has been driving us to become a smarter and smarter animal. And there's actually, there's actually a lot of evidence for this, this hypothesis. In fact, our assembly into groups may have accelerated, if not created, a tendency to think. And this theory stresses the special challenges posed by living in close proximity with others of one species and confronting the demands of a complex social environment involving constant cooperation or competition or other demanding features. But what's interesting about the social environment, more so than the physical or biological environment, at least until very recently, is that we humans, both individually and collectively, create it. The physical and biological environment, they're around us. Maybe we, over the last few thousand years, been able to modify a little bit. But the social environment, we make it. We actually create the environment, which then feeds back and shapes our own evolution. So what we do is, is we, we create these social worlds, these social worlds then feed back to shape the kinds of genes we have that equip us to live in those worlds. And in fact, maybe we humans have been changing our social environment in ways that affect our genes, not just over long time horizons, but even over historical time periods. For example, maybe we could think about how uh, our social environment has been shaping our genes and their regulation over hundreds of thousands of years, over thousands of years, or maybe even just decades. Now, these types of long-term horizons have to do with allelic changes. That is to say, uh, the emergence of variants of genes that might be better or worse for you depending on the kind of environment you face. Kind of like the classic Mendelian genetics that you guys all uh, studied, I'm sure, in high school. Over short time horizons, however, these have to do with regulatory effects, how our bodies respond to the environment we face, social and otherwise, that, uh, that turns on or off genes that we have, rather than shaping the nature of the alleles, the genetic variants that we have across time. If we grant the relevance and salience of our social environment, and if we see the social environment as malleable over historical time, it begs questions about whether we are in fact evolving in real time in observable ways in response to social changes that we are both genetically and non-genetically compelled to make. Now, of course, as you already should have realized in this course, our biology and our culture have always been in conversation. For example, rising socioeconomic status with industrial development resulted in people becoming taller, right? We've seen, or living longer. We've seen examples of that in the class. This is a biological effect of a cultural development. And taller people require a change in architecture. Any of you who've gone into colonial homes on a, on a tourist trip and sort of had to squat down as you went through the doors and said, wait a minute, these colonials lived in, you know, really different size houses. They didn't have high ceilings. This change in the architecture is a cultural effect of a biological development. So there is constantly a conversation between our culture and our biology. But here we are talking now about something more fundamental, our genome. Does culture reshape our genome? Now, the best example that we have for this so far, and that's described in your readings about how macro historical developments could affect our genes is the evolution of lactose tolerance in adults. 
the ability to digest lactose, which is a sugar in milk, confers evolutionary advantages only when a stable supply of milk is available. So for example, all of us can digest milk because we have the enzyme lactase, which digests the sugar lactose in milk. We all have that in infancy when we suckle at our mother's breasts. We need it in order to survive. That's how we evolved, we're mammals. But in the ancestral past, more than 10,000 years ago, you couldn't digest milk when you were an adult. Lactase stopped working when you were an adult because there was no milk for you to drink. When you were weaned, you ate regular food and you never drank milk again for the rest of your life. So why can any of us, those of us that can digest milk as adults, why can any of us drink milk and de derive nutritional value from it? It turns out the reason for this is that between 3,000 and 9,000 years ago, in multiple locations, principally in Africa, human beings domesticated milk producing animals, cows and goats and sheep and camels. And therefore suddenly our environment was changed and there was milk in our environment. So those among us who by chance had mutations that could digest this new food in the environment could outcompete the people who could not digest milk into adulthood because we had an additional source of food and an additional source of clean hydration in times of water spoilage. So the argument is that we humans, through a cultural innovation, the domestication of animals, changed our environment. This changed environment creates a new selection pressure on us and changes the course of human evolution such that now, a few thousand years later, billions of people can digest lactose as adults. Now this study here from Sarah Tishkoff's work, which is some of the best work in this area, examines this and I won't go into detail, but what she does is, is she looks at the genotypes, whether people can digest lact, whether they have the genes that allow them to code for lactase into adulthood, lactase persistence and lactase non-persistence and lactase intermediate persistence. So LP is lactase persistence, uh, LIP is lactase intermediate persistence, and LNP is lactase non-persistence. And she looks at various traditional groups in this region of Africa. And she also looks at their cultural style. Do they have domesticated animals or not? And she finds that those groups that have domesticated animals have these genotypes and other otherwise similar nearby groups that do not have uh, these domesticated animals do not have these uh, genotypes. There's a correspondence between phenotypes, genotypes, and herding behavior. And this is also an example of convergent evolution in humans in response to the social environment. Multiple different mutations have independently arisen repeatedly across time in different groups of humans to cope with the fact that, oh my goodness, all of a sudden there's milk in the environment conferring this advantage. And in fact, there are other similar sorts of possibilities too beyond animal domestication. So many things that we humans have done over the last few thousand years may be changing the course of human evolution, not just animal domestication, but the development of agriculture or the invention of cities, which have grammatically increased human population density or the migration to high altitudes on our planet or rules that we have promulgated regarding endogamy. In other words, we invent religions. Those religions often specify who you can marry. And once we specify who you can marry, it can change the course of our evolution. Or of course, the invention of modern medicine, which takes people who might otherwise have died because of their genotypes and saves their lives, preserving those genotypes and allowing them to spread. Or finally, climate change. There's no doubt in my mind that the changes our generations have made in changing the climate of the world, which will last a few thousand years, unless we make dramatic changes, is gonna change the course of evolution. For example, we might you know, uh, have different traits uh, than we otherwise would have, but for the fact that we have modified uh, the world. Just to, just to put a few more specific examples on some of the items on this list, 
The development of agriculture changed the biology of malaria. Uh, because what happened is, is, as we started tilling the land, we created new opportunities for puddles where mosquitoes could breed near where we lived. So we changed the land by having agriculture, we create puddles, and now the previously existing life cycle of malarial parasites and mosquitoes can affect us. And in so doing affected the prevalence of at least two different low activity versions of alleles or genetic variants for an enzyme called G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. In other words, those of us who had certain variants of G6PD did better in the face of, uh, of, um, of malaria. And, uh, and those genetic variants have arisen repeatedly between 1600 and uh, 11,000 years ago. A similar story can be told about relatively recent mutations that confer advantages in terms of surviving epidemic diseases such as typhoid in Europe. These diseases, typhoid and tuberculosis, were made more likely when agriculture was invented and the density of human settlements increased and when far-flung trade became possible. So those individuals among us who had some natural immunity that happened to arise from a genetic mutation to these conditions fared better or our genes, you know, are the course of our evolution was changed. So this is another example of how cultural change may affect our genes. These stimuli can be technological as an animal domestication or medicine or social as in population density or rules about endogamy. The Tibetan people who split off from the Han Chinese and settled the high altitudes of the mountains there, which was a collective cultural action have different hemoglobin metabolism related genes than the rest of us. Their bodies adapted in response to this cultural innovation of, of settling this high mountain plateau. And increasing population size in the last 10,000 years made possible by cultural evolution has accelerated or may have accelerated genetic change in yet another way. More people alive today because of our technology, the fact that our species is so much more numerous than it probably otherwise would have been had we not been a cultural animal, makes it possible because of this larger population size to see more adaptive mutations. Larger populations evolve more easily than smaller populations. So the agricultural revolution fostered larger tolerable population sizes and hence fed back to foster more opportunities for evolution in our species. In fact, as many as 1,800 out of the 22,000 human genes we have evidence are being actively selected for in historical time. And many of these stimuli are probably human created. In other words, we humans over the last thousand years even have changed our environment and we can see the signature of evolution in about 1800 genes, about 10% of human genes because of what we are doing to our world. And this table taken from your readings summarizes many examples of the function or phenotype and the inferred cultural selection pressure. And, and some of these examples I've already mentioned, I'll mention one, a couple of others here uh, at the bottom, it's possible that we humans are smarter today because we invented cities. I'm not saying that urban people are smarter than rural people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is when we invented cities about seven or 8,000 years ago, we created a new, more demanding environmental niche for our species that may have changed the course of our evolution and led to different kinds of brains being present today than would have been present had we not invented cities. Or for example, and we can see the signature of this in our anatomy. Another example that's very famous is the invention of fire, which probably, or the mastery of fire, which probably occurred over 1 million years ago. When you can use fire to cook, uh, uh, um, when you, to cook carbohydrates like coming from, uh, from plants, and, and, and protein that comes from meat, from animals. The fire is a kind of pre-digestion. 
And, and what happens is as a result of the fact that we suddenly can cook our food is that our masseter muscles don't need to be as big and as strong because we don't need to chew our food as much before swallowing it to prepare it for digestion. Our intestinal tract can get smaller because we don't need as long a digestion, digestion tract to digest the food. And as a result, our rib cages can get can recede so they're not as big. So our intestines get smaller, our ribs change, our jaws change, our jaw bones change, our anatomy changes and evolves because of the cultural innovation of, of mastering fire. Rules and practices favoring um, and, and uh, circumstances that favor endogamy is another example of a social factor that can affect our genome. This is the global distribution of marriages between couples related as second cousins or closer. So in some parts of the world, it's much more common to marry your first or second cousin than in other parts of the world. Here are some parts of the world, for example, where maybe 50% of marriages are consanguineous. Worldwide, couples related closer than second cousins and their progeny account for about 10% of the global population. And we know that mortality in first cousin's progeny is about 3.5% higher than if you marry an unrelated person. A decline in consanguineous marriage is expected to reduce the prevalence of complex genetically based diseases. And in fact, several contemporary social processes are affecting mainly reducing the prevalence of consanguineous marriages. Population density, the fact that we live in cities, group size, the fact that they are large, migration, the fact that we move, urbanization, the fact that we have smaller family sizes, all of these are affecting the availability of unrelated partners. So norms regarding marriage change as a result of these innovations and then affect the kind of genes that are transmitted from generation to generation. We were probably relatively consanguineous for much of our history, and this affected the existence of homozygosity on long stretches of the genome. In other words, in the human genome, if, we, if you often marry a relative along a long segment of the genome, you won't have two different variants of the same gene. You'll have the same variant because you've married someone closely related to you. On the other hand, it turns out, and this is a complicated idea, Maybe I shouldn't go into it, but let me explain why. It turns out that marrying your third or fourth cousin may be optimal. You don't wanna marry someone or mate with someone that's too closely related to you because it increases the likelihood that your offspring will have a serious problem and die. But on the other hand, you don't wanna marry someone that's too dissimilar than you, according to a paper that was published in Science about 10 years ago now. Uh, so if you put on the x-axis, the coefficient of relatedness between the the, the two partners, and on the y-axis, the, uh, the uh, fecundity or the, the number of offspring that survive them, you get a parabolic shape that's the peak of which is around your third or fourth cousin. The reason the curve goes back down afterwards is that when you start uh, reproducing with people that are further and further unrelated to you, it is theorized, you get a breakdown in co-evolved genetic complexes. In other words, variants of your genes near each other on the genome over centuries and millennia have co-evolved to work together. And when during meiosis, you wind up uh, reproducing with someone that is too dissimilar, you might wind up getting two, for this gene, you get one variant, and for this gene, you get another variant, and they've never seen each other before and maybe don't work so well together. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside, and I'm not taking a stand just to be clear on who anyone should marry for whatever reason. I'm just describing the biology of us as mammals, which is in keeping with the biology of other mammalian species. And if you're interested in marriage systems of which there's an enormous variety in human beings, you can learn more about this in my book, Blueprint, and also on how and why we evolved to have certain kinds of practices when it comes to our mating behavior. This is a ridiculously extreme example of the impact of culture. Uh, this is the voluntary human extinction movement that has its own website, May We Live Long and Die Out. This would obviously be a very radical uh, cultural impact on our genetic evolution. 
if we actually uh, adopt this. And they have a fascinating FAQ on their website, you know, with questions like, are you, are you really serious? And, you know, how do I join? And you can order stickers and t-shirts and things like that. Okay, so that's the first thing, okay? How, how over very long time frames, thousands of years or longer, cultural change uh, can modify human evolution. Now, in order to understand the second idea, which is gene by environment effects, uh, which is the second way that the social can become biological, uh, we have to first review how the biological can become social in the form of behavior genetics. And, uh, and one key technique uh, of behavior genetics for the last 30 years has been something known as twin studies, which many but not all of you have heard about before. Twin studies uh, can be used to study the genetic basis for social phenotypes. Something known as heritability is the proportion of, of phenotypic variation in a population that is attributable to genetic variation among individuals. So if you say this you know, height is heritable, what you mean is, is that people with certain genes are shorter than people with other variants of genes who are taller, but that's not the only thing that explains height. Nutrition and other things may also explain height. So we wanna quantify, well, what fraction of the variation in height is heritable, relates to the genes that you happen to get randomized to get when you were born. What twin studies do is they take dizygotic, same sex dizygotic twins, fraternal twins, and monozygotic twins who are either reared together or reared apart and examine how similar they are. And I'll explain that in just a moment. And what they find is that the heritability is often between 0.35 and 50, 0.55, between 35 and 55% of the variation in, uh, in various social phenotypes can be explained by your genes. And this is roughly equal to the heritability of, of biological phenotypes, like major depression or alcoholism or schizophrenia, for example, which have strong genetic components. So the point here is that we can use twin studies to evaluate not just for biological phenotypes, but for social phenotypes, what fraction of the social phenotype relates to the genes you got rather than to the cultural environment you were exposed to. And so here are some social behaviors that arise from genetic variation and the extent to which these traits are correlated between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. So for example, let's look at, um, at uh, uh, oh, I was going to pick infidelity in females. Let's look at uh, something less, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, what would be a good one to pick? Um, let's pick something here. Uh, the social responsiveness of boys, okay? So we take uh, dizygotic twin boys and we find, so we compare the social phenotypes between pairs of boys that are monozygotic and pairs of boys that are dizygotic raised in the same family. And we say, we measure something called the social responsiveness of the boys. So we have two twin boys that are monozygotic. They are identical twins. And we see that knowing the social responsiveness of one member of that twin pair is really good at predicting the responsiveness of the other, like 70% or whatever that is, 0.7% of the variance can be explained. Or we now look at the dizygotic twins and we find that in boys, and we find that the social responsiveness is much lower. The difference between those two, comparing those two allows you to make an inference about to what extent is this genetically driven, is social responsiveness genetically driven versus non-genetically driven. Things that are more similar such as in girls, social responsiveness, when there's a little difference between the blue and the red line, that means that, uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's not driven very much by genes. And when there's a lot of difference, it means it's being driven a lot by genes. Because if monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins within the couplets are similar to the, each other, probably means that it has to do with the environment. But when there's a difference, when knowing whether someone is a monozygotic twin or a dizygotic twin makes you better able to predict whether a person's twin 
has the same qualities that you do, does, that person does, that means that there's a genetic component. Now it's crucial to realize that twins share 50% of their genes only in expectation. That is on average, in expectation, fraternal twins share 50% of their genes and chance can play out in all sorts of ways. Lucy and Maria Aylmeyer shown in this photograph are twins. They're from Gloucester, the, Gloucester in the United Kingdom and are two of five children born to a white father and a half Jamaican mother. While their other siblings have a blend of features from their parents, Lucy and Maria are in many ways opposites. No one ever believes we are twins because I am white and Maria is black, Lucy said. Even when we dress alike, we still don't even look like sisters, let alone twins. And here's the whole family, including the two twin girls who are adorable. The, the, the father and the mother, their sons and their other children. So these twin studies rely on the statistical fact that dizygotic twins share 50% of their genome, but actually dizygotic twins could share 45%, 49%, 50%, 51%, 55%. Once in a while, very rarely, they might share very little of their genes in common. Or once in a while, fraternal twins may share so much of their genes in common that they're mistaken for identical twins. This is one of the issues with twin studies and is one of the reasons with modern genomics that people are using different techniques to try to understand behavior genetics than, were, than was common in the past. And they've begun actually now to drill down. By genotyping you, I can quantify exactly how similar you are to your siblings. So you might, many of you have the experience that you look a lot like your sibling or you're very similar to your sibling. And others of you have the experience, I'm nothing like my sibling. You could have many genes in common or few genetic variants in common with your siblings. And we can now use genotyping methods to quantify exactly the extent to which you are similar or not similar to your siblings. And furthermore, using similar methods, we can begin to assess the fact that the, that the effect of your genes is not restricted to the structure and function of our bodies, but also affects our minds and behaviors, including traits as diverse as religiosity, friendliness, novelty seeking, altruism, and so on. So in the past decade or so, we've moved beyond twin studies to probe the effects of specific genotypic variants on specific phenotypes. The effects of individuals' genes, however, the, effect, the effects of individual genes, however, are very small. The vast majority of things do not look like the classic example of Mendel's peas or sickle cell anemia that many of you learned about in introductory biology. In other words, you know, when you study introductory biology and you do all those Punnett squares that I'm sure all of you did in high school, and you learn about these simple examples of big S, little s, you know, crossed with big S, little s, and then what happens as a result, most human phenotypes aren't like that, are not like sickle cell anemia, for example, which is a monogenetic uh, illness. Most human phenotypes rely on hundreds or thousands of genes. And so it's very difficult to know, and each, any one gene in that set has a tiny, tiny effect, is not deterministic. So um, for example, a team of hundreds of scientists from around the world did a massive study of the, the role of genes in, um, in human education. This is an old study now, seven years old. There's actually been confirmed by more modern work of 125,000 people. And here they are looking across the, in chromosome six, looking locus by locus in the genome and seeing, well, to what extent is this locus, associated? this is called the Manhattan plot. To what extent is this locus associated with the, uh, with, uh, the amount of education you have? How about this locus? How about this locus? How about this locus? And bang, right here in this specific location, they get a hit on, an, on, a, on a locus, a single nucleotide, a single base pair, that if you have one variant of this versus another, you know, ACTG, you're more likely to have higher educational attainment. 
But unsurprisingly, the estimated effect size was tiny. The so-called R squared was 0.02%. Tiny, tiny amount of the variance in how much education you have could be explained by your genes. Most of the variance is explained by what your parents want for you, where you live, what kind of society you live in, uh, what kind of schooling is available to you, and so on. Uh, so I, I need to be very clear that I am not saying that genes determine education wholly, not at all. Moreover, but they do play a role. Moreover, our genes encode a variety of what you might think of as potential biological selves. And which biological self gets realized can depend in part on the environmental and social conditions we experience over the life course in a variety of ways. And that's what I'm about to come to. So you have within you a different set of biological shell selves that you might have, but which self gets realized depends on what environment you happen to be exposed to. And the human genome is basically static during the life of an individual, but the actions of the genome are not. Let me illustrate this with a couple of examples before I move on to the topic of social epigenetics and close with some, um, some big ideas, some other ideas. I should pause there. Are there any questions so far? I can't see. Maggie, are you here today? I am. I don't see any questions. All right, thanks. So the point here, and this is illustrated by a very controversial reading, uh, and I gave you a set of readings about it in the syllabus regarding, uh, which relates to the following. That is, regardless of whether a gene is wholly or partially responsible for a physical or behavioral phenotype, the environment may determine whether that gene is expressed. And an individual's response to the environment may in turn depend on what genetic variance that individual has. And this is what is meant by a gene by environment interaction. Here, the idea is that whether a gene expresses itself depends on what particular environment the individual happens to find themselves in. And specifically, the social environment is what we're talking about. Genes modify environmental effects. And, and in other words, what happens to you as a result of an environmental exposure may depend on your genes. And environments modify genetic effects whether your genes are expressed may depend on your environment. A very famous paper about this, which is constantly being re-examined, was in your reading and demonstrates what we're talking about. So the question is, there's a 5-HTT gene on, in the serotonin pathway, and there's a promoter region of that gene. Here's the gene, here's a promoter region, which uh, regulates the, whether this, how this gene is and how much this gene is expressed. And there can be mutations, not just in the gene, but in the promoter region. And certain mutations in the promoter region may give a lot of expression or a little expression of this 5-HTT gene. Now, in the promoter region, there can be a short allele, which is associated with lower transcriptional efficiency, or there can be a long allele, which is associated with higher uh, which, uh, uh, transcriptional efficiency. And on the left is a graph taken from your reading that shows the probability of a major depressive episode. So now we look at how likely are you to have depression in adulthood, depending on the number of stressful life events. So did you have one stressful life event? Maybe your parents got married or you were homeless or two, maybe you were homeless and you were sexually abused or three or four or more. And the question we're asking is to what extent does stress map to having major depression. If you have the LL allele of the promoter region to this gene, this study claimed, it didn't matter so much how many stressful life events you had, you tended not to have depression. But if you had the SS allele with lower efficacy of gene, with a, which has a lower efficacy of gene promoter, the more stressful life events you had, the more likely you were to be depressed. But if you had no stressful life events, it didn't matter 
what variant of the gene you had. Down here, it doesn't matter. The, this is a gene by environment interaction effect. Whether the gene variant causes you to have depression depends on what kind of environment you're exposed to. Did you have a lot of uh, stressful life events or not? Conversely, whether the stressful life events cause you to get depressed depends on what kind of genes you have. Some of you may have heard this in terms of dandelion versus orchid theory. For example, some children, despite being horribly abused, survive and grow up just fine. They're known as dandelions. And other children, simply because of the genes they were born with, when abused, have cataclysmic consequences the rest of their lives. They're orchids. This is a gene by environment uh, effect. On the right-hand side are similar, uh, uh, a similar graph, uh, now related not to stressful life events, but rather in terms of maltreatment uh, by the child's uh, parents or relatives or environment, uh, which shows the association between childhood maltreatment between the ages of three and 11 and adult depression between the ages of 18 and 26. Now to be very clear, this example is, is beautiful because it's so simple to describe, but it is extremely controversial and many scientists believe that it is not in fact true, but the idea is still true. The idea of gene by environment interaction effects is true, even if this particular example is not. And this example is very um, powerful in illustrating the points we're discussing today, which is why I teach it. And you can see point counterpoint responses in the readings if you're interested in digging more deeply regarding this particular example. Here's some work from my own laboratory, which, um, which was you know, a way of thinking about another kind of gene and by environment interaction that transcends specific environmental exposure. So now we're saying, we're not gonna look at exactly you know, whether you were abused or not abused, or you know, uh, whether you were in high mountains or low mountains or something. We can imagine that we can think of the total milieu in which subjects live as itself as the kind of environment that might modify the effect of a gene. And we can also consider the idea that this environment can change across time. Now to evaluate this hypothesis, we use longitudinal data collected over 30 years to test whether the well-documented association between a variant of the FTO gene and obesity varies across birth cohorts time periods and the life cycle. Individuals that were homozygous or heterozygous for the big A allele are known to be at greater risk of obesity. And what we found is that the effects of this gene, that is to say of having the A allele, the big A allele, not only vary across age as shown here, but also across cohort of birth as also shown here. So for example, here is the effect of the big A genotype, the AA genotype on your body mass index is on the Y axis and your age is on the X axis. So, so if you have the big age, the AA genotype, as you get older, uh, you get fatter. And uh, this happened to people who were born before 1942 in the light blue and people who were born after 1942 in the, uh, in the purple. It didn't matter when you were born. As you got older, you got bigger. However, people with the AT genotype, we see a gene by environment interaction effect. There is a steeper gradient for uh, if you have the AT genotype, if you were born after 1942 than before 1942. These results suggest that genetic influences on complex traits like obesity can vary across time, presumably because of the global environment, uh, because the global environment changes and modify the allelic penetrance, the, the, whether the allele can express itself or not. In other words, if you had been bar born with the AT genotype, which was protective against having obesity, but you had been born a long time ago, 
it wouldn't have mattered as much because the environment wasn't obesogenic. But now you take a group of humans and you put them in an obesogenic environment and now suddenly a gene which didn't matter much in the past now suddenly matters. Whether you express a genetic variant that manifests itself in obesity here can depend on the total environment in terms of when you were born, where the environment is totally different now than it was 50 years ago. This work raises the question of whether broad environmental changes might have differential impacts on the body mass index of individuals based on genotype. Many hypothesized environmental influences on the rise in obesity that we studied earlier in the course did indeed occur after the early 1940s, including technological advances, reducing energy expenditures at work, as well as the increase in the caloric content of processed foods and so on, whose effect may be experienced most strongly by individuals whose tastes and habits would have been influenced at a young age. This example I've just given you is very simple to the previous example. In other words, if remember here I said, if you had no stress, if you were exposed to no stress, it didn't matter what genotype you have, you didn't get depressed. And here I'm telling you is that if you had a certain genetic variance, it wouldn't have mattered if you were born into a world which couldn't have made you obese. But if you're born into a world which can make you obese, which genetic variants you have can make all the difference a gene by environment interaction effect. A further more subtle overarching point is that the phenotypic expression of individual level genetic variation and the ability of scientists to detect it may depend on historical contingencies. Whether scientists even found an effect of this genotype on this phenotype may depend on when in time subjects were born and even when in time the researchers did their research. This is a kind of social observer effect for genetics. Imagine, for example, that right now, there, some of us have genetic variants that make it easier for us to live during an ice age. But it doesn't matter because we don't have an ice age. But a thousand years from now with climate change, maybe there'll be an ice age. And suddenly, some of us with those allelic variants will fare better. There'll be a gene by environment interaction effect. Whether a gene expresses itself or is relevant to your fate can depend on the environment in which you are found and vice versa. Finally, Let's consider how the social can become biological in another way in very short time periods, not by changing our genome, but by controlling its expression. The regulation of the expression of our genes and variation across individuals and in how they are expressed falls to a set of processes known as epigenetic effects. And these in turn may also be under social influence. Now there are three main classes of epigenetic regulation of genes. In other words, how, uh, how the genes are regulated by phenomena outside the DNA. One is the so-called methylation of the DNA. So for example, um, different uh, base pairs within the genome acquire methyl groups. And when you acquire a little methyl group, it affects how that gene is expressed. Another possibility is called histone acetylation. So that these are the histone proteins. The DNA is wound around these histone proteins. And now you can have uh, acetyl groups added to histone proteins and they affect whether genes are expressed or not. And finally, there's a phenomenon which I won't go into known as microRNA and RNA silencing. So here are little methyl groups tagged onto the DNA, which is looped around the, uh, the um, the, uh, the histone proteins, which affect how the gene, whether and how those genes are expressed. So this has to do not with a sequence of bases in your DNA and allelic variation, but rather with how active the genes are. And recent work is opening up this remarkable way that our social environment 
may be in conversation with our genes and is begging new questions. And I gave you a couple of readings regarding this new work. Our exposure to factors such as these may affect our biology in possibly adaptive ways by regulating the expression of our, expression of our genes. So things like poverty, starvation, parental care or abuse, family size, language volume and complexity to which you are exposed as a child, the education that you have had, something known as the operational sex ratio, which is the male to female ratio when you reach sexual maturity, or the neighborhood in which you are raised or born. All of these may affect which of your genes are turned on or off by the kind of epigenetic effects that I just described. What is more and distinctly these epigenetic processes may leave long-term marks on your body. A child raised in poverty or abuse may be marked for life, their body and their genes even shaped by the experience of stress. And this is a devastating biology to imagine that the people who we abuse or marginalize in our society or who, who no fault of their own are born into poverty or are denied educational opportunities because of our maladaptive social policy, or because we are unable to find ways to reduce violence in the communities that these children are born into, marks their bodies for the rest of their lives in a way that might harm them. One study scanned the entire genome and found that whereas 5% of differentially expressed genes could be attributed to differences in sex and ethnicity, 50% of differently expressed genes could be attributed to whether the subject lived in an urban or rural environment. That is to say, which of your genes are regulated or turned on or off may have a lot more to do with the social environment you inhabit even than what your race or sex is, which is a big deal. Some key experiments have been done by, uh, by Meany and, and Ziff I went to a talk by Moshe Ziff about, I don't know how long ago it was now, 15 years ago. And it was one of those talks, I happened to be at, in Bethesda, Maryland when he gave this talk and I was like, you know, blown away by some of these results. He had been doing experiments doing rats and I'm gonna summarize those experiments, but it's a deep and interesting biology if you're interested in this. Um, and you can, you can quantify uh, a, a, a mother rat, rat's maternal behavior can be quantified in part by the extent to which she licks and grooms her pups. So here is a really solicitous mother rat. She is moving her pups. She is nursing her pups. She is licking her pups. She's taking good care of her pups. But like other behaviors, rat moms vary in this behavior. So for example, this is just a uh, dams are female rats. This shows individual variation in maternal licking and grooming, and it has a sort of bell-shaped distribution. Some moms are not very good. This is the average mom. Some moms are quite good. And this maternal care affects the regulation of the glucocorticoid, the steroid hormone, glucocorticoid or the stress hormone pathway, which we discussed earlier in the course in the rat's offspring. For example, rats that neglect their young and do not lick or groom them, result in the pups having increased hippocampal, that's a part of the brain, hippocampal glucocorticoid receptor expression. The rats, the baby rats are stressed because their mothers have neglected them and they upregulate their glucocorticoid receptors in their brains. Gene promoter regions that control the expression of those stress hormone receptors are methylated more or less permanently under the two conditions. Mom took care of you, mom did not take care of you, affecting the amount of receptor expression in the pups as a result of the social exposure. Uh, and so here, these rats here have low licking and grooming. You get methylated, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, promoter region gets methylated and it results in this, uh, this glucocorticoid uh, receptor not being expressed you get decreased glucocorticoid receptor expression, high cortisone levels, uh, high anxiety, and low licking and grooming of their children. Conversely, high licking and grooming, you get, uh, 
you get a promoter region here, higher expression, and so on. And we know this is not genetic because we can do cross-fostering experiments where we secretly move the pups from one uh, dam to the other dam. They don't, they don't know the difference. Rats identify their young by where they are located. They can't, unlike sheep, which need to smell their young to know who is their young, or penguins, uh, rats locate their uh, offspring by their physical location. So we can sneakily move rats from one uh, nest to another. And then by that kind of cross-fostering experiment, we can show this is not a genetic effect. This is an epigenetic effect. And in fact, there are also structural changes in the brain that can be observed that correlate with this change in epigenetic control, uh, which I mentioned a moment ago, that you can actually look in the hippocampus and in other parts of the brain and see the structure of the neurons, how that has changed as a result of the social environment that these pups had when they were tiny. And in humans, some initial work validates these ideas. For instance, the study of suicide victims who had suffered abuse, suicide victims who had not suffered abuse, and controls who died not by suicide showed patterns similar to these patterns in, uh, in neural branching in their brains. And abused suicide victims had much lower glucocorticoid receptor expression in various tissues than non-abused suicides or controls. So this raises two important points. First, we carry with us biologically records of the world we experienced before. Our bodies are marked. We embody the social world around us. And second, we might actually transmit this in a kind of neo-Lamarckian inheritance. This is a crazy set of ideas, which is discussed in your reading, which suggests that you might pass along to your grandchildren. I don't, the evidence for this in humans is weak, but the evidence in, um, in, uh, in, um, in animals is, is strong. You might pass this along to, uh, to your grandchildren by, uh, so your genes haven't changed, the sequence of your DNA hasn't changed, but which genes are turned on or off in ways we don't fully understand may be transmitted across a couple of generations. So if you were raised in famine or in a violent state like Afghanistan or were abused or faced lopsided sex ratios, so it was very stressful for you, for example, in China and India, when we have female infanticide and it's, it's stressful, for the for the during uh, at, upon entry into adulthood for the males because they can't find females, so if you face these lopsided sex ratios, your body might change in ways that affect how you raise your own children, and in some sense this makes sense. The epigenome, the sequence of methyl tags, for example, on your DNA, is a is a biological mechanism that serves as a medium for adapting the genome to an altered environment it may face over short time periods during life. If your early life experience is one of hunger and danger, you need a different kind of body to cope with it for the rest of your life than if it had been one of satiety and safety. Yes, uh, someone raise your hand, but I can't see who it is. Severin, go ahead. I'm wondering because uh, I definitely heard stuff like this, but I don't know like the controls that are in place for these experiments. Like how do we not know that that is something that's cultural? Like if, if your grandmother was raised in a like society that has a lot of famine, well, I, yeah. I'm projecting, that's like my family. So like yeah. what happens is that like she, like for the rest of her life, um, just like pretend or like- Yes. Goes about as though there is still a famine because that's like ingrained culturally into like how she looks at the world. And if your my mother was raised in that environment, she too like through yes. cultural like diffusion gets that. Yes, you're in humans, it's extremely difficult, but we can do experiments like that with, um, with mice. This is a very provocative experiment that uh, I, I think I assigned this. I can't remember if I assigned this in the readings. You did. Yeah. So in this experiment, what's done is these rats are conditioned to have a, an odor and to get a shock whenever they smell the odor. And uh, what's amazing is, is that, and they startle, they don't like it when they get this odor. So 
they, uh, they upregulate certain genes associated with the ability to smell this odor or respond to it. And what they find in this experiment is the grand, the F2 generation, the grandchild generation of these rats still will startle when they are exposed to this, uh, uh, this uh, sound or this odor, uh, even though they're no longer being shocked. It's like, it's like cultural learning transmitted biologically, Severin. It's creepy as hell. And nobody knows, nobody knows how this works exactly. When we, when I was taught biology, and I suspect when you guys learned biology, you were probably taught that during meiosis, all the methyl tags are stripped from the DNA. So people don't know exactly how this happens, but this is a very well-conducted experiment that shows that it does happen, but people are still working it out in animal models. I'm sure something similar happens in humans, but we don't know how yet. Uh, let me back up. So, uh, uh, so this study uh, uh, showed this 200, this 2014 study showed that when mice are taught to fear an odor, both their offspring and the next generation are also born fearing that odor. The gene for an olfactory receptor activated by the odor is specifically demethylated in the germline and apparently and consequently the olfactory circuits for detecting the odor are enhanced in a way that lasts across generations. And we just don't know how. Super cool biology. I wish I could do this in my own lab. This is a paper, however, that we did do in my lab. Um, and this is another speculative epigenetic effect in humans. And the idea here is that it is stressful to be the supernumerary sex, especially for men. So something, the operational sex ratio is the male-female. You can also compute it female-male, but for consistency, let's compute it male-female. It's the male-female ratio when you reach sexual maturity. And ideally, from the point of view of mammalian reproduction, it would be about one. If it's higher than one, like, like in China and in India today, where it's, it can, in some regions, be 1.2 even, you've got a 20% excess of males, it's very stressful for the males and lots of stressful for the females. In certain other animal species, it has naturally arisen that the females are more numerous and you find the opposite effect. So this isn't, I don't mean to overgender this, but these are just the results in humans. And so you can compute the operational sex ratios here on the x-axis and you look in, and you can look at the hazard of death across time. And these are two different data sets uh, in this paper that we looked at, let's see, on the uh, left, we plot mortality after high school for men and the school level sex ratios in 1957 in the state of Wisconsin. So we looked at Wisconsin, we, were, we, we eliminated all same sex schools. And then we looked at what was the male to female ratio in your graduating class in Wisconsin in 1957. And then we followed you for the rest of your life. And we found that if you were a man that graduated from a high school with a higher and higher male to female ratio at graduation, you lived less long. On the right, we, uh, we do something similar with seven, almost eight million uh, people uh, in, uh, in all 50 United States. And we looked at in the state and the year in which you reach sexual maturity, what was the op operational sex ratio? And then we looked at your hazard of death after age 65, and we find a similar pattern. Now, the idea once again is that something about being exposed to this stressor at the time of sexual maturity marks your body in a way that may uh, harm it for the rest of your life. In a kind of superficial way, you might imagine that the men are stressed because they have to compete more with one another for access to mates. And as a result of this stress, their bodies are worn down more and they live less long over the rest of their lives. So there are three distinct sorts of ideas we've been considering in the topic of social epigenetics. First of all, we've seen that social factors can regulate our genes. These are provisional ideas. I'm not saying these are certainly true in humans. I'm not saying they're true in all situations. I'm saying there's a lot of suggested, suggested biology and some nascent social science that supports these ideas. This regulation is long lasting in an organism. We know this from other animals. There's no reason it wouldn't be in us. And there's suggestive evidence that these effects may be transmitted across generations. It's po popular to speak about the culture of poverty. 
or the intergenerational transmission of poverty. And it's clear that a lot of that has to do with social factors. Unsurprisingly, if you're born poor, you're likely to be poor yourself in adulthood and your children are likely to be poor. You just don't have any money. But it's also possible that some fraction of that effect relates to how your genes come to be regulated by the fact that you were exposed to poverty. It's not just your behavior that's shaped by being born poor, it's your body that is shaped by being born poor. There's some fantastic work done by Sendel Mullenathan at the University of Chicago, an economist there, looking at the neuroscience of poverty and how being poor affects how you think. And uh, they've done some fantastic natural experiments looking at farmers in Bangladesh, for instance, how they, they do cognitive tests on these farmers when there are times of uh, famine, when rainfall is low versus when rainfall is plentiful. And they found that, find that the cognitive performance of the farmers varies according to how stressed they are by the lack of rain, which if you're a poor Bangladeshi farmer, believe me, your whole life depends on the rain. Now, remember earlier in the class, I forgot when, about a month or so ago, maybe more, we introduced this idea of the so-called conserved transcriptional response to adversity, the CTRA, which is a physiologic response in which white blood cells, for example, have an alteration in gene expression, which is optimal to deal with different types of microbial exposures in dangerous environments that have historically been associated with injury. And the CTRA is a pro-inflammatory skewing of the leukocyte basal transcriptome, and it is adaptive in response to physical threat, given that such threats were historically associated with increased risk of wounding and bacterial infection. So back then, oh, this is all screwed up here. I hate it when the formatting gets screwed up. Uh, so this, this N-O-W now should be over here. So back then, you know, we faced physical threats. And when we faced these threats, our bodies had to upregulate their white blood cells because we might be wounded. We might have to fight infections. We might need more fibrinogen we talked about earlier in the course to clot and cope with our wounds. And now we face uh, social, symbolic, and imagined threats, but still activate the same pathway. Back then, it was useful because we had anti antimicrobial response and wound repair, but now we get inf uh, inflammation-related disorders. And the chronic activation of this in our bodies can result in a whole host of adverse health consequences, as we've seen. So here is how exogenous control of human gene, gene expression, say by stress, might work. There are extracellular signals from the endocrine system. For example, you start pumping out cortisol because you're stressed or the sympathetic nervous system like norepinephrine, adrenaline, you, you're noradrenaline, you're pumping it out right now because you're stressed, you're threatened by your boss or by your poverty or by a police officer or someone frightens you. And those bind to cellular receptors, which result in and move through the cytoplasm to the nucleus, which bind to the promoter region which upregulates certain genes. So now you get mRNA that then is translated into proteins and these proteins then modify your health and behaviors. And so this is how, for example, social environmental condi conditions, including our subjective perceptions of those conditions can reach deep inside our body and regulate the expression of a very broad set of genes. These types of pathways of how we come to embody the social world around us are amazing, are <laughs> just amazing at the intersection of, of social science and biology, and I think are gonna be on the frontier for the coming, uh, coming decades. So in the field of what is known as biosocial science, a crucial and challenging topic of research in coming years will be this. How and why does the social become biological? How and why do cultural and social forces reshape our genome over our lifetimes and over our evolution? And why are these questions both hard and important? Well, they are technically demanding. They operate at multiple levels from the social to the bodily 
to the cellular, to the genetic. We've got problems as usual with bi-directional contagion, uh, uh, causation. The social can become biological, the biological can become social. It's hard to know what's going on. And of course, they're morally fraught. I've kind of skipped over that today, but pretty much everything we've talked about today, you can easily imagine there are all kinds of moral and political aspects. I'll come back to that next on Thursday uh, in a more detail on the moral and political aspects of these things, but these are not easy topics to discuss. Human virtues that sustain our sociality or that relate to our propensity to be just or to cooperate might even be involved in a sort of large scale feedback loop such that we come to internalize the social world around us deep in our genes. In fact, maybe these virtues like justice and other features of social organization determine our genes at least as much as our genes determine them. Any questions? Go ahead, yes. Sarah. Sarah. Uh, let's do Miriam first. Um, Miriam. Thanks. Um, is there evidence and research into how long epigenetic changes and like environmental effects can last through generations? Like, is there, does it stop at like three generations or is it sort of infinite once there's a change, it just- I don't, I don't think it's infinite. <laughs> I, I don't know in rats how many generations they've gone down. I suspect without ongoing stimuli, eventually it'll extinguish. So I don't know the answer to that. And in humans, I'm pretty sure no work like this has been done in humans yet. If any of you encounter such work, please send it to me. In fact, in general, if you encounter readings and stuff that you think I should see, please send them to me. Cause I like, one of the ways I add readings to the class is students send stuff to me. And I'm like, oh, that's good. We should have that next year. So you can you can uh, burden future Yaleys by your suggested readings now, if you'd like. Severin. This is, I guess, along those lines a little bit. Um, but I was just wondering on your opinion on something. I definitely remember reading something like three or four years ago and kind of dismissing it because it seemed like very Lamarckian. And at the time I was like, there's no way that this is possible. But it was some editor wrote something in the Times or the WAPO, something that um, people who survived the Holocaust and their descendants had elevated levels of depression and anxiety, even if they were not directly raised by uh, the, the survivors of the Holocaust. And I was wondering kind of like, would you think that this is something that, that, that's that's possible, very difficult. But... It's possible, yes. It's possible in a host of ways. Biological, it's also possible. Social, as you alluded to earlier, how were they raised by their parents and grandparents? You know, my father was a little boy in Athens when the Nazis occupied Athens. You know, he had a very different memory, raised me in a different way. But there's another thing, which is, and this is very common in Jewish circles, people say this, the, you know, the, the people who survived, often their ancestors were more neurotic. You know, why did my people survive? because we were anxious as hell at Kristallnacht and our people fled. So in other words, another possible explanation for what you describe is that the survivors may themselves have been genetically different or had different attitudes. Do you understand what I mean? It's hard to know the causation there, right? Which direction? And in general, it's very difficult to talk about these topics in humans, although no doubt we are animals, right? These things that occur in other animals that don't not occur in us, they occur in us. It's just much, much harder to disarticulate the biology and culture uh, in, um, you know, in our species. Are you learning? Good. See you on Thursday. I think you'll like Thursday. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.